Hello and welcome to the Gut Reset Summit. I'm your host, Dr. John Dempster, and I'm very excited to introduce someone to you today that you may already even know, Dr. Allison Seebecker. And Dr. Seebecker has been on many of these summits, which is why she might be a familiar face, but she's been specializing in SIBO since 2011. She is the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient from the Gastro ANP and has been teaching advanced gastroenterology at NUNM, and you can tell us what that is in a moment, since 2013 and is an award-winning author. And she was the co-founder and former medical director of the SIBO Center for Digestive Health at NUNM, NUNM. And her integrative SIBO protocols have helped thousands worldwide. And Dr. Seebecker's free educational website is SIBOinfo.com. And we're going to hear so much about everything to do with SIBO today, Allison. But first of all, I want to thank you and welcome you to the Gut Reset Summit. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Now, most of my speakers, and I know you are one of these, have an incredible story as to how you got here. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up talking and becoming one of the world's experts in SIBO? <laughs> I bet it's pretty much the same story as many of these other people. I was suffering from digestive troubles, right? So, so often it's that we we have these troubles. I had digestive troubles um, all through my childhood and teen years, and um couldn't figure it out. I went to a lot of doctors. Then eventually I went to medical school, right? And, um, you know, had access to phenomenal experts, you know, cutting edge and no one could figure it out. And then, and then I started to learn what it was. And, uh, and when I did, it turned out to be SIBO, right? <laughs> and when I did, um, I teamed up with my old gastroenterology professor, actually, because he felt the same, like, whoa, this is mind-blowing information. And we sort of formed a, a team to raise awareness within within our professions just to get the word out. And that's what we've been uh we've been doing ever since, myself also. And you know, I, I think also the the real fire that that lit under me was when I started treating it, I got symptom relief. I got a lot better. I and I just keep thinking I wouldn't want people to suffer when there's help. So that's why what inspires me to share the information. Oh, well, I love it. I love the story. And I know you're continuing your expertise in education all the time, but let's break it down a little bit here. We've heard a lot about SIBO in recent years, but there's also another acronym that might be replacing SIBO. Can you tell me a little bit more about what IMO is? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's really just a new name for an old thing. <laughs> so in SIBO, um, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And uh, there are three types that are based on the gases that uh, different bacteria make, hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide gases. And the methane one, the methane type of SIBO has been renamed as intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And there's just two reasons for this. It's somewhat linguistic. Uh, the, the bacteria that make methane gas aren't actually bacteria. They're archaea, a, a different microorganism. And so it's technically incorrect to call it intest uh, bacterial intestinal overgrowth. So we had to deal with that. And then um, secondly, they can overgrow not just in the small intestine, but in the large intestine as well. So the SI for small intestinal was, was too narrow. So, you know, they just gave it a new name. But for anyone who has been already learned about SIBO, it, it's just what we used to call methane SIBO. It's, so it's the same thing. And I still call it that all the time because I use those words for so long. I kind of go back and forth, you know. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's super helpful to clarify because, you know, that is a more accurate definition, in my opinion, too. We see, and we'll get into the testing, but we see on these results oftentimes where the methane is like starting to cut off at that junction between the small and large bowel. But, you know, maybe let's dive into that part of it right now is, you know, one of the rules that we have at our clinic is, you know, test, don't guess. How do we test to know if we have SIBO? I have so many patients come in telling me they have SIBO, but they haven't actually done the testing yet. So, what can we do to really quantify this? Yeah, you know, such such good point. I agree with you completely. I'm a, a huge proponent of testing because we this is a case where it doesn't just give you the diagnosis, but it um, informs what treatment we're going to choose, and it even informs how many rounds of treatment we may need. We can project that forward. So, in, in this particular case, the uh, and it's a breath test is extremely useful for everyone involved, and um. 
also to your to your point, um, there are were new definitions that came out about SIBO about two three years ago from big gastroenterology associations, making it clear that we can't diagnose it by symptoms. Any clinician would know that because it has the same symptoms as IBS, and and that has the same symptoms as about thirty five other diseases. They're non-specific symptoms. They're, so they could be so many things. And so, you, so how can you just say it's that when it could be 35 other things, right? So you need the test as well to be able to diagnose it. So we use the, um, the breath test for, um, for SIBO that uses as its substrate, you have to drink a sugar and then you have to take your breath. Uh, lactulose is our main one. And it's test for the gas is hydrogen and methane. And now there is a test on the market that also additionally tests for hydrogen sulfide, at least in the US. I don't think it's come to Canada yet. Not yet. So, no, we're pushing for it. I know. So we have to at least test for hydrogen and methane. It used to be called the hydrogen breath test. We mostly now just call it the lactulose breath test. Um, but it has to at least test for hydrogen and methane and then maybe hydrogen sulfide. And we use lactulose. You can use glucose and you can use fructose as well. And also just, you know, for anyone listening, um, I really prefer a three-hour test. And that is because we know both hydrogen sulfide, I didn't mention this, and methane can overgrow uh, in the large intestine. And three hours al allows us to see that time. And it's very useful information for us. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly what we use is the three-hour test. And it is so important. Now, once we have this diagnosis... What do we do now? Conventionally, we're going to talk about this. There are options and then there are non-conventional options. What do you find? Well, what are you using and what are you seeing the best results with? I use every option available to me <laughs> because um, as a specialist, I mean, you probably know yourself. Um, and as you're in practice longer, you see more difficult cases and I need every tool that's in my toolbox. So I use we actually have three main um, antimicrobial antibacterial type uh, treatments. We have pharmaceutical antibiotics, herbal antibiotics, and elemental diet. And as to what do I see working best, the great news is they all work equally. Um, and I, I can say that from using all three equally for years and years and years, uh, not one is is more effective than the other. It's just a matter of how well it matches a certain person. And that is something we definitely encounter is out of these three options, we will often find only one or sometimes two really work very, very well. And so that's important to know. That's kind of why also I use all the all the tools, because sometimes we might prefer to use me myself or the patient might prefer to use herbal or elemental diet. And it's it's just not the best match. And we we might wind up having to go to pharmaceutical. And you know, who knows why that is? There's we could think of them so many reasons, but yeah. So the great news is they all work equally well and they have phenomenal statistics of working excellently, like in the 80 to 90% range, which is near unheard of for most treatments for conditions. What are some of your favorites? What If you can get into a little bit more of the details of, well, why don't we start with some of the herbal uh, options? What would some of your favorite considerations be? Absolutely. Well, um, we've been able to tell from extensive before and after testing what works. And so I can just share with you what works. And luckily, they kind of all work. So for, and it's basically treatment is by gas type when you're using either pharmaceutical or herbal antibiotics. That's a really important point because um, doctors or patients who don't know that might try treatment, find it ineffective, don't realize they're not targeted to exactly the gases they have. So for um, hydrogen gas, we have found berberine, neem, and oregano to be, all three of those to be very effective for bringing down the hydrogen. And usually we use two at once, one or two. So the reason we don't use all three at once is because we haven't found that it brings gas down any, any more than just using one or two of those herbs. And also, um, it's very, very common for most people to need more than one treatment round. Um, because this is, if you think of it, it's a little bit more of like a chronic condition uh, or a chronic infection sort of, it pre presents that way. And, and in those types of scenarios, it's different than acute. It's, it's different than like an acute urinary tract infection or something like that. A one round doesn't always do it. And so it's nice when we don't use all three herbs because then we have something else we can use for the next round. And so that's, we really like, and also why do it if if you don't need it, right? So, so those three are good for hydrogen. Now, when it comes to methane or emo, um, 
that because that's archaea, we have to have some different elements in there that will work on those. So we still use one of those hydrogen herbs, and then we add in either allicin, which is the antibacterial component of garlic, or Atrontil. Atrontil is a three herb combination product, and it actually works a little differently than a typical antibiotic, which directly kills bacteria. Um, this works by inhibiting the archaea being able to form, create methane gas. So it's the methane gas itself that causes the symptoms and the problems. Methane gas is called a gasotransmitter, a gasotransmitter, because it's active um, in the nervous system of the small intestine. And so what we're really after is just not getting that methane gas produced. And so uh, the herbs in Atrontil work in that way, not so much directly killing. But one way or the other, we when we have methane, we need to do double herbal antibiotic therapy. One something for the hydrogen, something for the met, for the methane. And then when we come to hydrogen sulfide, we also use one of the hydrogen herbs, um, and then we add in typically bismuth. And bismuth isn't actually an herb, right? It's a, a, a mineral metal, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll call it a supplement. But um, bismuth is um, able to bind. Uh, bind hydrogen sulfide, as well as it has some antibacterial activity. And so that's the combo we want to do there. And one other thing is, is that the oregano, one of the hydrogen herbs, we have also found in high dose is effective against hydrogen sulfide type SIBO. So, and, and just, you know, the basic concept here is there's different microbes making these different gases and we have to target our treatments to those just like we would for you know cold versus you know some other uh, infective agent and luckily one last thing i'll say is the research has come along uh, year after year so well where we we finally pretty much know which bugs are the culprits in each type it's it's not fully all down to strain yet but we're almost all the way there so those are some great herbal options. And now, why don't we just compare that to the antibiotics for a moment? What are some of the classic considerations from that uh, standpoint? Yeah. So the main antibiotic we use is called rifaximin. In the U.S., um, it's sold as Zyfaxan, uh, but rifaximin is the drug name. And it's a phenomenally interesting antibiotic. Some people don't even call it an antibiotic. They call it a eubiotic because it it doesn't work like a typical antibiotic in that it doesn't increase yeast overgrowth. It doesn't hurt the microbiome. In fact, it's been shown to help the microbiome, like it increases lactobacillus and bifidus. And um, this is shown in studies. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and it has all these benefits actually. So um, some say it's an antibiotic with a eubiotic property. So, so luckily that's the antibiotic that has been shown to work the best. It also stays in the small intestine. Um, and doesn't absorb into the bloodstream. So that's all good. And then when you have methane, we would need to do double antibiotic therapy and we would add in either neomycin or metronidazole. That's what the studies have been on. And then for hydrogen sulfide, we add bismuth again. So rifaximin plus bismuth. So those are those are what we do for the pharmaceutical antibiotics. And is it safe to take them generally? Can you take those with herbal, um, uh, herbal antimicrobials? Well, we don't typically mix. The only way we usually mix is, um, I mean, you can, is if someone can't or doesn't want to do the neomycin or the metronidazole, uh, then we'll use a methane herb and add it with rifaximin. Um, you could do it the opposite way. It's just not commonly done, um, mm -hmm. probably because rifaximin is a drug many people are are pleased to take if their insurance covers it or if they can afford it. it. It is unfortunately very expensive depending upon the circumstance of, of health insurance. Yeah. And like anything, you know, that we talk about treatment options, always discuss that with your primary health care giver before you start self <laughs> prescribing, as we say, but uh, these are, but I guess, I guess one thing is, is you don't, we don't typically like do the herbal regimen complete with the herbal with the antibiotic it's not necessary it's just you're wasting money and product you know yeah one other thing that just came to mind is you know we've there's been a lot of myths and sort of controversy surrounding probiotics and SIBO what would you comment there How, where are we at with the science in the, in the recent literature okay the science here's what I have to say the science and clinically what we observe and practice show different things. And right. that's our problem. So the science is great. <laughs> it shows there are there are a lot of studies on probiotics for SIBO, and almost all of them show benefit, show very good benefit. 
And standing back from it, we can see that they use all different kinds of probiotics. They use spore probiotics, typically a bacillus clausi. They use lac- various types of lactobacillus and bifidus, singles, combos, all sorts of things. And then probiotic yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii, all have been studied successfully for SIBO. Then we come to the real life with the patient and we find a very mixed bag. We find there's always miracle cases with probiotics, you know, and we just wish that could be reproducible and it would happen for more people. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of people who respond poorly. They get very aggravated in their symptoms and it seems to make things worse. Sometimes even we halts our progress. So strange, right? And then we have all the people in the middle who have kind of meh results or good results. And um, if only we could figure out ahead of time which probiotic would be best for that person. You know, that's another thing we we don't know very well. So what what I would say, what I recommend is just try it. I, I think it's a great thing to try probiotics because the studies are good and probiotics help so many people. Um, I think it's a good thing to try it before or during your antimicrobial treatment. What I don't like to do is wait to try probiotics until you've gone through however many treatment rounds you've needed to get yourself all better and then try them. Mm. Since some people respond not so well, I think it's better we try them ahead of time so we know what the playing field is like and we can we you know can make adjustments. It's just also because when you some people are lucky and they only need one one treatment round and they're done and it's that's amazing. But most aren't like that. So if you've spent your time and effort and money to get to get feeling great I don't want to rock the boat with something that can rock the boat like that. So I do it beforehand. Yeah, very smart. Okay, anything else we're missing from an actual supplement prescription? I know we're going to get into the diet here uh, in detail. Well, uh, yes, I would say we would I would say elemental diet is a supplement uh, okay. prescription. Sure. Yeah, so elemental diet is um our third main antimicrobial treatment option and this is a a medical food beverage and it typically comes as a powder that we mix with water. Mm-hmm. And um, what the protocol is for treating SIBO um, it was laid out by Dr. Pimentel, who's our lead researcher in this field, is you drink this food replacement um, for two weeks in place of all meals. And so you're not eating during this time. And thus, it's kind of a form of fasting, although you are taking in the nutrients you you would normally, but in liquid form. It's kind of a form of fasting, and and it's thus sort of mentally challenging to do, emotionally mentally challenging, uh, because you know you're drinking your nutrition instead of eating it for two for two weeks, fourteen days. It's a long time, so a person has to get their mind ready for this, and their family, <laughs> um, you know, get everything in the right circumstance. But it is very very effective, and there's one thing that's very special about it, which is that it has the ability to lower gas levels more than pharmaceutical or herbal antibiotics in one treatment wow. round. So pharmaceutical antibiotics, typically we do for two weeks. Herbal antibiotics, typically we do for four weeks. We can stretch those a little longer. Elemental diet, we do for two weeks. The um, the herbal and pharmaceutical antibiotics, on average, bring gas down around 30 parts per million per treatment round, on average. Sometimes it's more. Um, whereas elemental diet, it's about 70 parts per million for that two weeks. So this is where having the breath test can really help because if you see someone with very high gas, that would steer you and them maybe to the elemental diet, which maybe they wouldn't want to do otherwise because because they don't want to just drink you know, meal replacement for two weeks. But when if they see they have 150 part per million gas, that's going to motivate them. Yeah, I just want to do this one. And in two weeks, I might get it or nearly get it all. So very important to know about that. So um, the elemental diet is sold... Um, in you know from various brands um we have physicians elemental diet um elemental um elemental nutrition you know there's all sorts of supplement companies now luckily that sell it when we started we just had vivinex plus which is what the study was done on and it didn't have flavoring tasted bitter and awful it was a terrible circumstance now we have a lot better formulas available well, and that's huge. Yeah, these are uh, becoming more and more commonplace. Now, the other diet that was very popular and still has some, uh, you know, momentum, I would say. So I want to hear you comment on the low FODMAP diet, which uh, many people listening might be familiar with. Uh, how are you seeing that in comparison to the elemental as effectiveness? 
Okay, well, really two totally different things. So elemental diet is like an antibacterial treatment. Um, it has the word diet in there, but you know we could substitute formula, elemental formula. And so that's like, we put that over on one category. And then the other category are diets, how we're gonna change what we're eating. And for SIBO, there are you know five or six good diets that are people would know about that are prescribed that we can use. Low FODMAP diet is um, very famous. The main reason it's, I think it's become so famous is because they did studies on it. And once studies started coming out showing that it helps IBS and IBD um, and these sorts of conditions, then gastroenterologists and primary care were happy to prescribe it. Whereas before they didn't want to prescribe anything that didn't have any studies. So this has made this diet take off like wildfire. In general, just stepping back from the the question of diet, how do we see diet helping SIBO? It helps symptoms. So it, in fact, it's one of the best possible things we can do for symptoms, meaning the most effective. It's it's when you really dial it in and customize it, you can get 100% symptom relief with diet. What we haven't seen it be able to do, and by the way, that's not everybody doesn't get that. I'd say on average, you get about 80%. 70, 80%, but which is still amazing. What we've never seen it be able to do is um, do what, basically do what antibacterials or antimicrobials do. Because basically as soon as someone goes off the diet, the symptoms return. So the, the bacterial overgrowth is still there. The diet just controls the symptoms because it's you're not giving food to the bacteria to turn into gas. And it's the gas that causes all the trouble that they're making, the hydrogen, methane, hydrogen sulfide. So um, fantastic at that. I mean, it has other uses as well. Like I think it can help reduce die off um, when somebody has very high um, overgrowth and gas levels. When we give antibacterials, there can be die off. And if you start a diet, I think it can bring the levels of the bacteria down a little, um, and then that may reduce your die off. And also these diets, they're low carb diets. That's what any SIBO diet would need to be a low carb, low carbohydrate diet, because carbs are what the bacteria eat to make the gas. Um, these have their own benefits. You know, they they can um, they can give weight loss in people who want weight loss. They can um, decrease inflammation and do all kinds of other benefits for the body. So, you know, many times people will, it isn't just the SIBO symptoms that go away. They'll have allergy symptoms go away and any other kind of inflammatory uh, circumstance you can think of, people will report help with that. So back to the low FODMAP diet specifically, this one I would call kind of um, middle of the road in effectiveness. It's, it's, I would say it's hit or miss. And the reason why is it's not created with SIBO in mind. Um, and the big thing here is that it doesn't remove the, the carbohydrate that we would call fiber, poly, polysaccharide fiber. In fact, it encourages uh, increasing your fiber, uh, long chain polysaccharide fiber. Um, so that is very troublesome for people with SIBO. Now, if you know that ahead, you can tailor the diet and, and just just lower the actual fiber in the diet and you'll have a much better success. So, and and that's really what I would say for any of the diets we use for SIBO, uh, it's helpful if you sort of understand the principles behind them. And then you're going to be altering them anyway, hopefully over some time, um, tailoring it to the person because any prescribed diet, the way it is, will have things on it that a person won't tolerate. And we'll have things that are said not to have that a person would tolerate just fine with SIBO. So experimentation is needed individually, no matter what diet you're doing, because we don't want to exclude any food we don't have to. You know, we want the broadest amount of nutrition. Right. Now, for the low FODMAP, if somebody was to explore that, what would be the time frame? Elemental diet, which is, again, more of a supplement, but that's about two weeks. What would you say for the low FODMAP? Right. So low FODMAP is, is used differently, right? Um it's done, well, we can do diet in, in a couple of ways for symptom relief. We can get in there, particularly like if someone's going to do herbal antibiotics, since that's a four-week, maybe even a six-week course, we probably want to get in there with some diet um, to reduce their symptoms because it might take a month before they're, before the levels start to come down and we get some symptom relief. Um, you can also wait to do diet until you're done with any of your you know, three types of antibacterial treatments, pharmaceutical, herbal antibiotics, or elemental diet. Once sure. you're done with those, then you could start the diet at that point because hopefully uh, we've reduced the bacteria and you don't need to be as restricted on the diet. So you, there's no one right way to do it or there's no one right time. 
When you're doing a diet, we specifically think it's a good idea to do it after antimicrobials um, for about three months. And the reason why is because we want to do two things. We call that the prevention period. We'd want to do some kind of a low-carb SIBO diet and a prokinetic, which we can talk about. And we want to do it for about three months because SIBO is a condition that um, has a high relapse rate. The studies show about one third of cases don't relapse. However many rounds it takes to get their test negative, get their symptoms gone, that's it. They're done. But two thirds, the majority, will relapse. And this is because there's an underlying cause still present continuously causing the SIBO. And so in this case, when people relapse, we have to figure out what that underlying cause is and see if we can get rid of it. But the typical relapse time is, in studies, about two and a half months. I'd say in my practice, it was about two months. So if we can keep someone on um, a diet and a prokinetic for about three months, that gets us past the common relapse time. If we get past that common relapse time, then we say, let's see what we can, if this will hold. You know, maybe you're not going to relapse. And then we can stop the diet and stop the prokinetic. So three months is what's recommended at first. And then we see how it goes from there. You recommend basing your, when you say a relapse, are you based that on data or on symptoms or both? Both. So uh, so when someone has their symptoms return, we would want to do another test. And we'll want to find out. Because what if it's not SIBO? People have more than one thing wrong. What if it's the underlying cause generating symptoms, but we haven't gotten SIBO back? So I always recommend testing. Um, and so we base it on that. And if someone is going to be chronic, there are many currently incurable conditions that create SIBO and something like Ehlers-Danlos or scleroderma, things like this, diabetes. Um, we want to see over time how often they're going to relapse. And, and at, in the beginning, we'll want to retest them. But what, what we'll find is over a year or two, we don't need to retest anymore because we we're, we both the patient and myself get familiar with the symptoms and how it presents when they're going to relapse. And we if once we've tested enough times, we see what those numbers are like. And if we can track a pattern, then at that point, after a year or two, we don't need to retest anymore. Okay. And uh, you touched a little bit on the die-off reaction known as the Herxheimer reaction. How common is, like, we we do all sorts of different uh, treatment in the gut and, you know, whether it's in large bowel, um, we can often see a Herx reaction. Now, when it comes to SIBO, do you see that as frequently, differently? And if so, what do you do to help sort of mitigate any any uh, Herx reaction? I saw it very commonly in my practice, but uh, I can tell you a colleague of mine who was also a gastroenterology teacher says it's rare in her patient population. For me, it was something I needed to inform every patient about mm -hmm. that could happen. And if it didn't happen, we'd just be happy, right? <laughs> I think it's much more common in two scenarios. One is when the gas level is very high because there's just a lot more bacteria that's going to be dying. And then and then you know maybe the first round there's die off, the second round of treatment there now there isn't because we've already gotten the levels lower. The second place I would see it is when someone concomitantly had yeast overgrowth, intestinal yeast overgrowth. Um and my experience is that yeast overgrowth is worse than bacterial die off um yeast overgrowth die off yeast die off <laughs> is worse than bacterial die off and that would actually often be a clue for me if somebody was having really bad die off then i would suspect that they had yeast overgrowth as well um if i hadn't already tested them for it so what we do for it is well, probably no different than what you or anyone else does you know the the classic thing is lower the dose of the treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Lower the dose by half, see if that calms the reaction. It usually takes a day or two or three and then titrate back up. Um, you know, if you have to titrate it down to a fourth of a dose or that sort of a thing. If we know ahead that a patient often experiences die off, then we preventatively titrate the medicine up. Now, um, when it's really happening, we use things like charcoal, various um, anti-inflammatories, and alkalinization. So, you know, it could be trace minerals, it could be Alka-Seltzer, you know, <laughs> anything to get alkalinization. I learned that from my Lyme colleague friends. They, they're big on Alka-Seltzer gold in particular, was, which is the one without aspirin. And um, But, you know, regular anti-inflammatories, herbal anti-inflammatories, fish oil, high-dose vitamin C. I also like... Um, 
Um, serum bovine immunoglobulins, I think they mm-hmm. help as well. They're expensive though. The other things I'm mentioning are inexpensive, very inexpensive. So that's what we do. And, you know, then of course there's always people who want to push through, but I always like to mention that there is die off that gets to a, a level of severity that it, you know, it's not going to be able to be pushed through. Mm-hmm. I want to get to prokinetics in a moment, but you know, it might be a good idea just to say, how do we get SIBO in the first place? Let's just have a quick, let's go back a bit here. You know, is SIBO, do, should we all expect to get this? Are there higher percentage groups than others that can get this? How do we get it? Yeah. So the number one most common cause of SIBO is food poisoning, also mm-hmm. called stomach flu or traveler's diarrhea. So that is something most everyone has experienced, stomach flu of some, you know, or um, food poisoning of some some sort or another. That is probably the most at-risk group, but it's still only about 11% of people who get food poisoning will go on to get SIBO. In this particular case, it's called post-infectious IBS. It has also another name, Um, but they're the same thing. And um, the the reason that is the most common cause is, if you think about it, everyone has probably had food poisoning maybe three times at least in their life, right? (laughs) Including little ones, right? Everybody has food poisoning. So if you just figure that out, then you realize 11%. Okay. That could almost answer everyone who has SIBO really right there. But um, there are plenty of other causes as well. There are many diseases that can cause it. And basically the, the primary physiologic underlying cause in the body, what goes wrong is the migrating motor complex in the small intestine, which is a form of motility or peristalsis slows down. And that is what the food poisoning is doing. It's actually an autoimmune reaction damaging nerves that make that migrating motor complex go. For the other conditions that cause it, most of them are um, inhibiting the migrating motor complex. So I mentioned diabetes. We know diabetes can cause nerve damage. That's its mechanism here. Um, Hypothyroid. We know hypothyroidism causes constipation often. That's the mechanism here. It slows the migrating motor complex. Um, Scleroderma, same thing here. The um, intestinal lining is sclerosing or stiffening same thing. And um, I know there was another one I mentioned, oh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Yeah. Here, the tissue's too lax. The tissue's so lax, it, it can't contract properly. Um, there, there are many other conditions as well, traumatic brain injury. Um, parasites has been, you know, has been documented to cause the nerve damage. Then there's anatomical concerns. And mostly here, it's about something that can cause a partial obstruction. So adhesions are going to be the number one cause there. And internal adhesions are like internal scar bands. So this can happen from injury, accident, um, infection, internal infection. Probably the most common is surgery. Um, Many, many people have various surgeries in the abdominal region, and they can get adhesions that form in such a way as to push on the small intestine and, and cause a partial obstruction. So I'd say adhesions are probably the second most common cause of SIBO after food poisoning. So these, these are some of the ways people can get it. So it, the, a good thing to say is it's not because people ate too much junk food. This is what people, oh, oh God, I ate too many carbs. I ate too many potato chips. It's like, no, <laughs> something has to really go wrong with the body to allow this to happen. We have so many protections built mm-hmm. in to not get this situation something else has to really disturb the system do you find any medications are triggers oh yes um opioid narcotic painkillers are probably the most common one many people mm-hmm. have to take them after surgery so they have a surgery what if it was in the abdominal region right and then they take the opioids but opioids we know they cause constipation they're slowing the migrating motor complex as well so that's very common um and actually, antibiotics have been preliminarily linked as a cause of slowing uh, the migrating motor complex. The antibiotics were not mentioned in the, it was a pilot study, but I can tell you clinically, we, I, we saw so many people come that said they got this after antibiotics, which is what makes people afraid to then use pharmaceutical antibiotics to treat it. But, you know, it, we we do have success when we use those three I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, no, it's so true. Uh, I, you've mentioned a lot about this motility, this migrating motor complex. So let's talk about prokinetics, obviously things that are going to help with the motility. What are these in terms of their classification and what do they do? Yeah, they, they're a category called prokinetics. A, a key distinction is that they're not laxatives. Um, their aim is to 
help with the motility in like the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine. Sometimes they do affect the large intestine, but often that depends on the dose we're giving. Um, now for the herb, there, there are both pharmaceutical and herbal options. For the herbal options, the um, it's not as much dose dependent. It's more the pharmaceutical ones. We can sort of affect different areas with our dose. But I like to always mention they're not laxatives because so many people with SIBO have diarrhea. You know, the main symptoms we didn't mention, um, bloating, pain or discomfort in the abdomen, constipation, diarrhea, or a mix of the two. Um, but still, even though diarrhea is one of the main symptoms, there's this slow motility in the small intestine that occurs together at the same time because the the two organs have different motilities, which is a strange concept, but they are um, really separated. They're separated by a valve, as is the stomach and the small intestine. So they, they have their own function, motilities, et cetera. So these prokinetics are very helpful because since the main underlying reason inside the body is this slow migrating motor complex in the small intestine, prokinetics are there to, to sort of give it a kickstart, help it work better in, in the small intestine. So these would be things pharmaceutically like um, procalipride is probably the star of the category. In um, the US, finally, we got it. It's called Motegrity. In Canada, it's called Resilor. In some countries, it's called Resitran. And uh, that's excellent, safe, really effective. And um, then we also use low-dose erythromycin. That's an antibiotic, but at low dose, it has a prokinetic effect. It's a standard treatment for slow stomach emptying, also called gastroparesis. And then we also use LDN, which many um, naturally minded uh, practitioners like to use, low-dose naltrexone. This um, is not technically a prokinetic, but it has been studied and shown to have a prokinetic effect, and it's been studied for SIBO. And so um, it doesn't always work in everyone like a prokinetic. So this one might be, you know, you have to make sure that it's enough, giving enough of effect. And I would say that's the same with the herbal ones. For the herbal ones, really what we have is ginger root. Uh, many people are familiar with ginger root helping nausea. Um, or motion sickness. And this is one of the main reasons it does this is it helps move down the, you know, the motility there. And um, another one that is sometimes used is 5-HTP, not as reliable, but that's added in. So we have a lot of prokinetic formulas now um, that people have been making. You can just use ginger root, but there's things like um, motility activator. Let me see. I can't remember all the names. I'm sure you've got a lot of them. <laughs> Prokine, Modal Pro, Motility Activator, GI Motility Complex, Gut Motility, et cetera, right? So we have all these- There's Lots of options now. Supplement companies making them. And the main ingredient is ginger root, and then they'll put in like 5-HTP. And we also have Iberogas. That's a, a liquid herbal combination originally from Germany. Um, I know in the, in the States, we get it from Amazon. Um, sometimes it goes out of stock, but uh, that one has a synergistic, it's been studied actually head to head against uh, several um, pharmaceutical prokinetics, cisapride and um, um, met metoclopramide. And in these studies been shown to be as effective, at least for the condition of dyspepsia. So Iberogast is, you know, a proven studied prokinetic effect. And, and you can't, yeah, you can't pull, you can't, the good thing is you know, to know is you can't pull out just one herb out of that. It's a synergistic blend. So these are very, very helpful. And we use these in the prevention period. You can also use them for some symptom control. Fantastic. Yeah, this is really helpful, Allison. Now, is there anything else about SIBO that we need to know today in terms of, you know, maybe non-conventional treatments that we haven't discussed? I mean, well, that that covers a lot of things. I, I would say two other things are always going to be helpful. Um, any way you can get stress control, any way you can decrease your stress is always going to help for any kind of gut condition <laughs> because um, all of our function is parasympathetic and stress just by nature is sympathetic dominant. So these two oppose each other. And anytime you can get your stress controlled in whatever way is good. <laughs> and then it will help, right? It will help. And then the second thing is actually visceral manipulation. Visceral mm -hmm. manipulation is um, a particular type of body work that uh, focuses on the organs. And um, this is such a physical problem in, in, in so many. This can really, really help. I noticed that in my most difficult cases, I would send people for this and uh, they would do better. And then I started thinking, why am I just reserving it for the tough cases? You know, mm -hmm. we should really recommend it. So, you know, you can look online for um, Baral Institute or Upledger Institute to um, to find practitioners internationally for visceral manipulation. 
Well, Dr. Seebecker, thank you for sharing again your expertise as you have many, many other times uh, over these summits over the years. And it's just, it's always a pleasure to learn from you. And I know everyone listening today uh, has taken in a ton of information. So how do we find out more about you online? Oh, my website is SIBOinfo.com, free educational website. And thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. And thanks for all that you do and, and have a great rest of your day.